right, well, we are going to start our discussion by sharing together in the affirmation from Romans that is week seven, uh, March 17th on your calendar. And this will be the um, affirmation that we will use this Sunday in church. So, let's begin. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life or angels or principalities or things present or things to come nor powers or height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yes. We're going to be looking at our last chapter, chapter four, which is focusing on communal confession. So our author starts out by stating, the worshiping community practices communal confession as it relates to the church as a whole. You know, we've moved from individual confession to mutual confession, and now we're looking at the church as a whole. But the community of God's people, the church, also sins and needs to hear God's word of forgiveness and to experience spiritual liberation. In worship, we acknowledge who God is and who we are in relation to this God of love and grace. All our needs and all of God's promises meet in this sacred liturgical space. In the movement to communal confession, our prayer shifts, as it were, from forgive my sins to forgive our sins. The corporate practice of confession, according to Ted Jennings, teaches us to see. It teaches us to see ourselves in the light of God's action and promise. The practice of confession is practice in the banishment of illusionment, self-deception, or dishonesty. It is a practice in honesty and in telling the truth. So in communal confession, we acknowledge our failure to be God's people. We recognize our sin as a community of faith and repent or turn back to God so that God can remember, put us back together and restore us as a living community of love in the world. Now, if you look on page 96 of your book, they outlined some penitential psalms or psalms of confession. If you have your Bible handy, I would like for us to read a few of these. And the first one I'm going to read to you is Psalm 32. So if you want to follow along, look at Psalm chapter 32. And this is one of the penitential psalms or psalms of confession. Oh, I'm sorry. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sins. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, you rush the, uh, the rush of the mighty water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Uh, 
I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now, if you will turn in your books to page 99, in the first paragraph, it talks about God calls the church to repentance, to confess its failure to be the community of light God intended it to be. And then he has the five symptoms of sinful malice that are in uh, Ephesians 4.31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, and slander. So those are the symptoms of sin and malice and not doing well. And yes, I can see that. But then he goes on to say, but to live in the spirit for the sake of the world means to manifest the signs of redemption and list the fruit of the spirit from Galatians 5, 22, 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I love how that ends with, there is no law against such things. <laughs> they even have to say that, but yeah. There is no law against love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Our author says communal confession has to do with our acknowledgement of the many ways in which we have failed to be the church and have been complicit with evil and how in our corporate worship, we confess, we repent, we hear, and we speak absolution. So then he takes the rest of the chapter to go through the different components of the service of word and table, our communion liturgy. And so I brought back the bulletin from the last time our community had communion, which was March 3rd, the first Sunday of March. Just to kind of compare from what he says to what, what we do. He says, the church engages in communal confession as a response to an invitation. And he has the invitation in your book on page 101. And it follows exactly what we have in our um, liturgy. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. So that leads us right into our communal act of, com communi of confession. Our communal act of confession, where we fail to be the community God intended us to be. So this prayer of confession and pardon identifies the primary concern here in terms of our disobedience. And it's not that we don't know what God intends. We actually know what God calls us to be loving and merciful, and passionate, just and true, but we choose to do otherwise. We embrace the ways of the world instead of the will of God. And immediately following the confession, words of pardon. In our bulletin, we have a list of confession and pardon. So we'll have our confessional prayer. And then we say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then we all say together, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And he brings us back to that whole idea about words shape us and how important words are in our lives. Um, I underlined the phrase, we become what we say and what we do. Then he goes into the Collect for Purity, which is on page 105, and this is one of the most ancient of the Eucharistic liturgy pieces, um, back as far back as 1549. And we have a card on the table that we're going to give to everyone that, that has that prayer printed on it, and then with some questions and reflection on the back for you to take home today, 
uh, to put that where you can see it and reflect on that as you continue throughout this journey of Lent. So within our liturgy of confession, um, there's some common themes that come together. Um, the one of them is it's, a, it's acknowledging how we fail to love God. Our hearts are turned in on themselves and our lives characterized by self-interest. Um, that instead of modeling a life of gratitude and benevolence, uh, we sometimes grasp for power, prestige, or privilege. And, and we can sin in our thought, word, and deed, but equally grieve God in our failure to take action in the direction of justice and peace in our broken world. And then the next section, he lays out the three, uh, what he feels are the three common bigger sins among the church today. Um, starting on, well, let's see, page 113. Our captivity to fear, and I thought it was really interesting, he pointed out how various forms of the statement, do not be afraid, appear at least 365 times in the Bible. We talked about that as a part of our Advent series. You know, do not be afraid, 365 times. Well, that's like, what, every day, right? Um, so we fear what we do not know. Fear is the root of all racism, bigotry, and exclusivism. And so he has written out liturgies for churches. If we wanted to use them. It'll be interesting to see if David uses any of them in his sermons, I think. Um, the second one is silence in the face of injustice. Um, too often the church has remained silent in the face of evil, injustice, and dehumanization. Um, he does acknowledge that the United Methodist Church has a long history of concern for justice, but the church writ large, as he calls it, sometimes turns a deaf ear or a blind eye. And then the third one, the penchant pin 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 for the vision. Did that ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> Where we are in our um, lives together here. Um, a divisive spirit of this age and that sub contributes to increased animosity and alienation by promoting a defective gospel rather than living in and for God's vision of our beloved community. Divisions within our world and in our nation are endemic. While the vision in the human family is nothing new, the animosity expressed and acted out in our common life today reveal fault lines that threaten to tear us apart. We feel this just as much in the church as in the world. So now we're going to move into a kind of penal <coughs> confession that Melanie's going to lead us in. This is something to take home. And as she said, this is a very old prayer and um, we have included this in worship services here at Boston Avenue, so it's probably familiar to especially people who've been here a long time. But on the back, again, it tells you that you can use this throughout the day. It may be easy to memorize if you've said it a lot in your life in the church. Um, but it's a good reminder of having God is with us and having the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. within. The activity that we're going to do together is um, in the book, he lists this act of communal confession as something that could be done in a worship service. May these words remind us of our need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness. Separation. Division. Prejudice. Exclusion. Harm. Neglect. Pollution. Extinction. Disregard. Ignore. Injustice. Impoverish. Hear now these life-giving words. May these words take root within us and become a living reality among us and through us. 
forgiven, receive, restored, listen, forgiven, welcome, conserve, share, forgiven, reconcile, beautify, compassion, forgiven, enfold, care, love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Okay, so take a few minutes at your table and talk about what effect did those different words have on you? How did you feel after the first words were read? How did you feel after the second words were read? We are going to close our time together for today and for this series of confession by sharing in communion. And our communion is open to all, as Linda helped us uh, remember that earlier. And it is by intention. There are wafers and barely, you know, keep it in the juice and then partake. And uh, when we get to that point, I'm going to bring a set to each table and you're going to serve each other around your table. Okay? So let us participate in our order for Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be in the church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. For we ask for joyful obedience. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. You lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy <coughs> Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the Lamb who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. 
that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Receive this benediction. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. But we are going to do our final closing by sharing together in our last affirmation. This chapter, uh, week 6, March 24th, is the affirmation from 1 Corinthians. So I'll give you a moment to find that. Let us share together. This, this is the good news, news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, and to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen.